All right, welcome to an evening of international queer writing presented by Words Without Borders and Foglifter. We are very excited to partner with Foglifter and have some of their contributors with us today. I am Alexander Guayo. I am a PhD candidate in comparative literature at the University of Michigan, a literary translator and a contributor to this month's issue. To begin, I would like to introduce our host for the evening, Sean Gasperby. Sean is a translator from Polish, as well as a past contributor to WWB's June issue of International Fear of Writing. His recent translations of Polish literature include Alice Island, A People's History by Magosiata Szejnert and The King of Warsaw by Szepan Twardok, for which he won the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development 2021 Literature Prize. He lives in Philadelphia, and later this evening, he will be reading from his new translation of Foucault in Warsaw by Remigiusz Rzynski. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome to tonight's celebration and reading. Uh, as Alex said, I'm your host, Sean Gasper Bai. Uh, tonight's event is a partnership between Words Without Borders and Foglifter to celebrate queer authors and literature. Words Without Borders expands cultural understanding through the translation, publication, and promotion of vital international voices in literature. Foglifter, which is rooted in the San Francisco Bay Area, is a platform for LGBTQ plus writers that supports and uplifts powerful intersectional and transgressive queer and trans writing through publication and public reading to build and enrich our communities as well as the greater literary arts. Tonight, uh, I'm pleased to present readings from writers and translators based around the world. You'll hear a poem on Palestine, a novel, a novel excerpt about a young Taiwanese woman coming to terms with her sexuality, a hybrid genre project that explores the impulses and imperatives of so-called assimilation, uh, a story of sexual exile from Panama, and much more. A number of today's readings come from contributions to Words Without Borders 12th Annual Queer Issue. Words Without Borders published our first queer issue in 2010. This year, in our 12th queer issue, we present seven pieces depicting queer characters confronting decisive moments. Some find themselves at turning points, while others reckon with past choices or cope with the fallout of decisions made by those around them. Writers from China, Colombia, Malaysia, Panama, South Africa, and Taiwan offer a panorama of contemporary queer lives. To read the queer issue, please visit the link in the chat. Uh, the readings tonight will be followed by a Q&A, giving you a chance to engage, ask questions, and have a Zoom-wide dialogue. Uh, we may have some first-time Zoomers joining us, so here are some tips. Uh, you'll see some buttons at the bottom center. Uh, first, please keep yourself muted. You can use the chat for applause and to drop in questions for our readers, uh, which will give them a chance to answer at the end. In the upper right, you'll see a couple of options, gallery and speaker view. We recommend speaker view, so you'll see the readers. We also have ASL interpreters and closed captioning available. To turn on the captioning, click the arrow next to CC at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. Nina Parada from Words Without Borders will be dropping various links in the chat as I mentioned. Uh, as you may know, tonight's event is free and open to the public, but we encourage you to donate now, during, or after the show to Foglifter at the link in the chat. So kicking off tonight's event uh, are our first readers, Lee Kotomi and Natasha Bruce, who will read from the award-winning Solo Dance. Lee Kotomi was born in Taiwan in 1989. She writes in and translates between Chinese and Japanese. Since 2013, she has been living in Japan. In 2017, her debut novel in Japanese, Solo Dance, won the 60th Gunzo New Writers Award for Excellence. In 2019, her novella, Count to Five and the Crescent Moon, was shortlisted for the 161st prestigious Akutagawa Prize and the 2019 Noma Literary New Writers Award. Her recent novels include Polaris, Moon and Starlight Night, an island where the equinox flower blooms, forthcoming in June. Polaris is the winner of the 2021 Minister of Education Award for Fine Arts, and Island Where the Equinox Flower Blooms was shortlisted for the Mishima Yukio Prize. 
you can visit her website at www.leekotomi.com. You'll find a link to her story in the chat. Uh, now Natasha Bruce will read from her translation of Solo Dance. Natasha Bruce translates from Chinese. Her work includes Lonely Face by Ying Peian, shortlisted for the TA First Translation Prize, Bloodline by Pati Gu, Lake Like a Mirror by He Shu Feng, shortlisted for the Warwick Prize for Women in Translation, and A Classic Tragedy by Xu Xiaobing, co-translated with Nikki Harmon. Forthcoming translations include Mystery Train by San Shui and Owlish by Dorothy Tse, for which she was awarded a 2021 Tenheim grant. She and Tse were among the winners of the 2019 Words Without Borders Poems in Translation Contest. So here's Natasha. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm really sorry that I can't join this event live, but I'm very happy to be able to contribute something by a video recording. I'm going to read a brief excerpt from Likotomi's novel Solo Dance, which is a novel that's a kind of coming of age or a kind of reckoning about a contemporary Taiwanese protagonist coming to terms with her sexuality and at the same time her identity as a writer. Um, and it deals first with her as a child and a teenager in Taiwan and then moves on to her as an adult studying and working in Japan. And I should mention that impressively and also really fittingly given the trajectory of the storyline, Kotomi has written the novel in both Japanese and Chinese. So I translated this piece from, from Chinese, but the full novel will be out next year in Arthur Reggie Morris's translation from Japanese. I thought I would read the same part that Kotomi has read in Chinese or, or perhaps will read in Chinese, depending on the order of these uh, recordings once the event is live. And then I will carry on for a couple of paragraphs. And uh, to give a bit of background, then in this text section, the protagonist is still at primary school and her first crush, Dan Chen, has just been killed in a devastating road accident. So this is her grappling, grappling with that grief. From that day on, her memories of Dan Chen were frozen. No new ones were made. Time had stopped for Dan Chen, while for her it kept on flowing, whether she liked it or not. She dreamed about it. In the dream, she was immediately aware that she was dreaming. Dan Chen was staring at her, smiling a steady but barely there smile. Her eyes were sorrowful. Dan Chen sad, she thought. But was that true? Who was really sad? Was the dream her experiencing Dan Chen's sadness, or was it just that she herself was sad? She became aware that Dan Chen was slowly drifting away. No, Dan Chen wasn't drifting away. It was she who was drifting away from Dan Chen. The two of them were standing in the same stream, but she was the only one being carried away by the current. Dan Chen was standing still, watching silently as she thrashed and struggled. Her parents noticed that she was behaving erratically and tried their best to help. Assuming the shock of the earthquake must have dislodged her soul, they first took her to a temple to call it back, making her down large quantities of holy water. When this failed to have any effect, they turned to Western medicine instead and took her to see a child psychiatrist. But the consulting room reminded her of the deathly white morgue and the fortnightly appointments only increased her suffering. None of them would ever understand and she didn't have the words to explain. She was in love with Dan Chen, but Dan Chen wasn't there anymore. How was she supposed to talk about that? The psychiatrist tried to pry open her tightly guarded emotions, searching for the cause of her behavior with questions that were almost comically off the mark. Her parents had explained that she'd been acting out since the earthquake, and this seemed to have led the psychiatrist to their same misguided conclusion. The shock of the earthquake was the reason for it all. Please remember to include your applause and questions in the chat. Uh, next, uh, Javier Estanciola and Alexander Aguayo will read Gustavo from Estanciola's acclaimed novel, Muddy Men. Javier Estanciola is a writer, university professor, and researcher. He has received the highest national literary award in his country for three of his plays of Mangoes and Apricots, Winter Solstice, Let's Talk About What We Haven't Lived, and for his novel, Muddy Men. His most recent plays, Cristo Quixote Tratado and Reversiones, 
merge historical research with a distinct Panamanian queer performance style. He writes short stories for one of the largest newspapers in Panama, La Estrella de Panama, and for the Central American cultural magazine, Casi Litera. In the excerpt of Gustavo, the main character of the novel, JJ, receives a letter from London from his stepfather, Gustavo, who has left his wife and her kids to move to London because he is gay. Uh, the excerpt has been edited for the reading, but you'll find a link to the full story in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Es aquí donde viene lo complejo, lo complicado. Mi huida sigue el mismo patrón de escape de miles de sediciosos del patio que han buscado exilio, paz y un volver a empezar en otros países, donde sea, por los últimos 20 años. Pero mis alas tienen otros plumajes. Te quiero explicar la tonalidad que tomó mi partida ahora que ya eres un hombre. Te quiero explicar que además de exilados políticos, religiosos o de conciencia, también existen los exilados sexuales. Por más de 30 años fui miembro de una manada de lobos que encuentra paz en su caos profesando que macho encima de macho es un ataque de bombarderos y torpederos que presagia extinción. Invertí 3.000 horas de mis sueños construyendo fantásticos planes de fuga de la celda de rejas gruesas y oxidadas que yo mismo construí para no convertirme en otro prisionero de una guerra ajena que aún no entiendo. Una guerra de hombres asustados. En vano trataba de aceptar la vigilancia de mi carcelero, de mí mismo, para luego derrotarlo y verme tirado en el piso arrastrándome y rogándole a cualquiera una caricia. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, now Alexander Aguayo will read from Gustavo. Uh, Alexander Aguayo is a PhD candidate in the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He received his AB in Comparative Literature and a Latin American Studies Certificate from Princeton University. He's currently working on a translation of Ignacio Gomez Palacio's works. Uh, take it away, Alex. First things first, the opportunity to be a part of your life and your brothers, to play the stepfather role was a privilege to me. My departure had nothing to do with you or your brother. In fact, it had nothing to do with your mother. If that hasn't been made clear, I want you to forgive me. Here is where it gets complex, complicated. My escape follows the same pattern of thousands of seditious people from around the country who have sought exile, peace, and a new start in another country, wherever for the past 20 years. But I'm a bird of a different flock. Now that you are a man, I want to explain to you the tenor of my departure. I want to explain that in addition to political, religious, and ideological exiles, there are also sexual exiles. For more than 30 years, I was a member of a wolf pack that found peace in its own chaos, proclaiming that man-on-man -man action amounts to an air bombing and torpedo attack against humanity. I invested 3,000 hours dreaming up fantastic escape plans from the very same thick and oxidized iron bars of the cells I built so I wouldn't become another prisoner of a foreign war I still do not understand. A war waged by fearful men. In vain did I try to accept the vigilance of my jailer, myself, only to vanquish him and end up throwing myself to the floor, humiliating myself and begging for anyone's touch. My life in your house was no more than another prison I built, so as not to fall into the claws of a mysterious, incredible, and mythological beast in a man's skin. In that house, in the room opposite yours, beside the most beautiful woman I have ever kissed, I soothed my anguish by dreaming that I grew the wings of a hummingbird and escaped the bourgeois rhythm of dinner at six, television at seven, and clean powdered milk at nine before burying my face in my pillow. When those wings would not take me far enough, I transformed my whole body into a vulnerary capsule that transported me to a world of yachts replete with leading men from French films, glasses overflowing with champagne, baguettes and strawberries lathered in cream, 
Only like that, JJ, did I manage to get near the world of free people. A world where one laughs with delight and hope. Just like your mom showing those big teeth and wrinkling her nose. A world where you, would, where you feel what you feel and you cry when you feel like crying. Like, the, Daniel, like Danielito who cries with fervor and desperation, letting a stream of snot slide over his lips to then inhale it back into his nose and announce that he can't breathe from so much crying. And that you had a point, JJ. There was nothing more invigorating than watching your brother cry. I loved seeing, your, I loved seeing you run across the kitchen to the bedroom and to the living room in search of your mom. Mom, mom, Daniel is turning purple again. And your mom rushing out, he's drying up, my baby's drying up. Your mom would toss poor, poor Danielito in the air hoping that on the way down, he would regain the breath he had lost from all the crying. With her defeated, it was my turn. Don't dry up, champ, Daniel. Throw him, Gustavo, throw him. And again, that scandalous bawling, this time awash in tears. I recall your face lit up by that little light bulb that Daniel turned on with the battery and wire one day of blackouts, among the many that caught us without candles or lamps. So you don't get scared in the dark, Jay. I like remembering his healing eyes, asking, asking you why you couldn't walk straight if you didn't have blood or scars on your legs. I'll cure them, your brother would promise while resting his warm, plump hands on your legs, waiting for his magical intervention to demolish your full-on swing, Celia Cruz on Calle Ocho in Miami. But nothing, JJ, you, as always, remained sunken into the, the armchair trying to escape, complaining about your fate, wasting away your life in front of books about sinful Greeks or inventing stories about fish in a tank. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to remind you that we have an accessibility packet and closed captioning available. Uh, we're also accepting donations for Foglifter a Bay Area platform of holding powerful intersectional and transgressive queer and trans writing. To donate, visit the link in the chat. Uh, now, Kanika Agraval will read from her exciting hybrid genre work, Assimilation Simulations. Kanika Agraval is an Indian writer and a diasporic hybrid developed across six countries on four continents. As an immigrant and former scientist in training, she works between and across languages, geographies, and disciplines. She received a BS in biology and a BS in writing from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She then earned an MFA in writing from Columbia University and a PhD in, literary, in English and literary arts from the University of Denver. And she taught academic and creative writing at both institutions. She has also taught writing at elementary and high schools and at shelters for people experiencing homelessness, addiction, and domestic violence. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Best American Experimental Writing 2020, Black Warrior Review, Filling Station, Foglifter, Notre Dame Review, Sand, and various SF and F publications. Kanika lives with her 11-year-old toy fox terrier in Denver, Colorado. You can also find her online at www.antiquarkic.com and on Twitter at Antiquarkic. And those links I think will be in the chat. Uh, the excerpt presented today explores the impulses and imperatives of assimilation, so-called, through the re or misarrangement and derangement of its forms and language or languages. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm going to read uh, short excerpts from two pieces that are part of a collection I'm conceptualizing as assimilation simulations. This is very new work, as in I was working on it up until a few hours ago. Uh, so I don't yet know if it's anything, um, but you'll tell me if it is, I hope. I'll show the text on screen as I read, since the interpreters and captioners may not have had a chance to review it. Um, also, the first excerpt is multilingual and depends on the possibility of multiple meanings and pronunciations that are best conveyed both visually and sonically. So 
So I in most alias is an anagram of assimilation. And this piece's lexicon is limited to words that can be formed from the letters in assimilation. I in most alias. I is an alt. I licit, slant it. Is it lit? I am mit it. Matin to matin as a thal. In, in, a, di. To, na, at, din. A, di. In na. I instills I, an iota, an iota. Am I a silt? Oh, am I a monist in my tosis? I ails in a liminal saison till tonal liaisons insist I is, is, and am. Mon am, see it sits in me's o. Is it somo? Mano a mano, me a me, I to I am. A mo, as intimal as atoms on atoms. I am as I amass, I also in slow mo. I moss, I moss, I moss, I moss, I moss, I moss. The second excerpt is from I Oil Saint Sam, also an anagram of assimilation. Here, uh, I've expanded the lexicon to include the words on the official reading and writing vocabulary list for the US naturalization test. I Oil Saint Sam. Not, not, who's here? Sam, Sam who? Sam the Saint. Sam who? Sam the oil man. Sam who? Sam the colorist. Sam colors? Sam colors in oil. How is Sam? Sam is as slim as the dollar bill. Sam slams on the atlas. What's Sam's aim? Sam's into soil. Sam does Sam right. Is Sam in the red? Who pays for it? We do. Sam's a slim slam man. Ain't Sam a saint? Sam's a capital man. Sam's not not a saint. Sam has mass in ass Latin on President's Day in February, Memorial Day in May, Flag Day in June, Independence Day in July, Labor Day in September, Columbus Day in October, Thanksgiving in November. Sam states omnis militias in sisto nimis. Si amant amamos nos. Who is we? We? Are we or are we not one and the Sam? As for I, I am in Sam's talons. I sin, I sin. And so I oil, I oil Sam. I oil Sam's elation. I oint Saint Sam. I am a lioness. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Panika. That, that was really amazing, really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, please remember to share your questions and your applause in the chat. Um, our next reader will be Olivia Kutsia, reading from Any Shadows in Cops and English Translation. Olivia Kutsia was born in Marintal, Namibia, and grew up in Electric City, a suburb of Cape Town, South Africa. 
She completed her high school in 1999 and began her higher education 11 years later. Olivia's professional experience ranges from retail work to volunteering and activism. She is an alumnus of the University of the Western Cape, as well as an alumnus of the University of Cape Town, where she completed her master's degree in creative writing in 2017. She plans to continue her academic career, working on PhD research around the history of COPS, and hopes her work adds to the growing volume of COPS literature. Olivia's writing, available on LitNet, ranges from poetry, opinion pieces, and translation. Olivia made her writing debut with her 2019 novel, Any Shadows, which she is currently translating from COPS into English. Her work is available for reading and sharing on www.litnet.co.za, and you can follow her on Twitter at Olivia underscore C-O-E. In this excerpt, the story's protagonist, Veronique, is worried about her friends and trying to ease the discomfort she is sitting with. She is sitting in her room journaling as she watches the people pass by in the street. Hi, good day. My name is Olivia Michelle Kutsia. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm really sorry that I can't join you live today. I'll be doing a reading out of my novel, Any Shadows, published in December of 2019 by Mujaji Books. I'll do a one minute reading of the original text, which is Cubs. Cubs is a language that we speak in South Africa. And then I'll do a three to five minute reading of the English translation. I really do hope that you'll enjoy it and thank you so much for watching. Now I will be reading the original text in Cubs. Wofstuk in, baas kaal. Dis dinsdag ochend, Veronique Blaikies of Niek, Susanne McKen, sit by die tafelbad voor haar kamervenster staan. Jake ochend vat sy tyd vir haarself met een koppie koffie, pen en papier. Sy trek dan die godein een wijd hoek om die wereld van buiten te kan sien. Die winter in begin die jaar vroeg. Haar kop is vol van Gershwin en sy al even gestoere met sy ma. Sy wen sy kon om sy af die tijd en sy sleep het, maar sy weet, jy kan net soveel doen vir mense. Sy het om al hoeveel keer gesê, hy moet uit, maar sy stoe eerder met Gershwinse duivels as met die donker wat in kaal sit. Nee, ek weet ook, niemand kan kaal sy ma skuld gee nie, want kaal het op, het na die tikt op haar hoek. Thank you. So now I will be doing the translation reading of Any Shadows. The title I'm, that I'm working with for the English translation is In the Shadows. Chapter 1. Where is Carl? It is a dark and cloudy Tuesday morning. Veronique Blake is unique as she's known to her family and friends is sitting at a makeshift desk. She starts every morning the same way. A steaming cup of black coffee, curtains pulled back and windows slightly pushed open, a perfect frame to watch the world go by. She opens the journal Bala Porter to celebrate their seventh year together. Winter is here, she writes. Her head is cluttered with worries, Gershman in his constant troubles with his mother, and Carl, who she hasn't seen for a few weeks. Sometimes Nick wishes that she could go and pack Gershman's bags herself, but she know, uh, knows life doesn't work like that. She scribbles across the page. Toxic relationships last because people stay. People will do what they think they must do, even if it means staying in a place where they're not wanted. But she could never understand straight people's obsession session. She could never understand straight people's obsession with trying to fix people who are not like them. What is there to fix? And Gershon's mother seems to be the captain of that club. If she only knew that her son is secret secretly dating her crush, past the riches. But Nick would rather deal with Gershon's demons than the dragon devouring Carl. She accepts that Carl is a lost case. Meth is an illness with no cure, and no one can be blamed for his choices. Auntie Mill always said, we make choices, and those choices paved the way for us. A few old magazines are stacked in one corner of Nick's makeshift desk. Receipts and bills lie scattered next to an empty bag. Next to an empty handbag. She tucks on one end of the towel wrapped around her body, back in its place. She leans back into the chair and reaches for the coffee mug. 
her eyes jump over the pot plants and, and small herb garden that she started in the corner of the, of the yard. She never thought she would have a house to call her own, let alone a garden. But there are many things she never thought she would accomplish. Nick's focus swings back to the streets. Most morning, most mornings she makes up stories about the people, but, but today she just sits and watches them pass by. She struggle, she's struggling to calm the uneasy feeling in the pit of her stomach. The rhythmic flow of the people moving in and out of her window frame has become part of her early morning release. Her own little real life movie. Little kids dressed up in oversized, oversized hand-me-downs and backpacks too big for their bodies. Who are chasing after their older brothers or sisters rushing to catch either a bus or train to school. A few group of groups of women all walking with sling bags tucked in their, under their arms, shouldering through the wind. All of them rushing to board a crowded bus that will take them into the city to one of the last remaining clothing factories. Nick chuckle, chuckles as she sees a few of her customers walking by. Because never mind how many times she goes to do their hair over the weekend, come Monday, their, curl, their curls will be tucked away and their cal colorful head scarves. The woman burst out in laughter as they exit Nick's window frame. Next, a group of young men enter dressed in paint-stained blue overalls, listening to loud music playing over a boombox, hidden from sight. The rhythmic flow of Shadow Heights was often something she missed and longed for while she was in Joburg. She missed the comforting sameness of every day. Nick's eyes zooms in on her neighbors, two elderly sisters as they shuffle through their front gate, waving down a minibus taxi coming up the street. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Take care and stay safe. Goodbye. Oh, that was really wonderful. Um, now it's my turn. Uh, I will be reading tonight from Foucault in Warsaw by Remigiusz Rzyński. Uh, I'll be reading uh, a chunk of the original in Polish and then I'll read my English translation. Um, Remigiusz Rzyński's book looks back on the French philosopher slash provocateur Michel Foucault's uh, late 1950s stint in Poland, which attracted the attention of the secret police. Um, but Rzyński also paints a portrait of queer life in Warsaw in this period. Uh, in this excerpt, you'll hear Lula, one of Warsaw's oldest drag queens, telling him about the places where men used to meet. Uh, a different excerpt from this book uh, made its first appearance in The Words Without Borders, Queer Issues, some time ago. Um, and the full book uh, will be out from uh, Open Letter Press next week on June 15th. So please keep an eye out for that. Uh, Piquette. Piquette, czyli miejsca z chatek. Na złotej była pikieta, która zamyśla się lula. Funkcjonuje chyba do dzisiaj. Dużo się tam działo. Koleżanki spacerowały w jedną, w drugą stronę, jak na wybiegu lub na spacerze w łazienkach. Zapomniało o tym, że to zwyczajna uliczka, a ich celem nie jest pałac na wodzie, tylko pobliska toaleta. Jak się już zaczepiły w ten czy inny sposób, to wchodziły gdzieś w bramę, w dwustronnym miejscu się chowały, czy schodkami w dół do toalety. Chwila uniesienia, a potem był od razu rozwój. W latach 90. znajdował się tu punkt Xero, a te, teraz znów otwarto WC pod patronatem grupy literackiej Tekalianie. Proszę, wiersz tu wima. Wszystko od dupy zależy. No i to jest prawda. Dalej barek kawowy, tak jak był, tak jest, nazywał się Arleki. Tam chodziły się zwłaszcza zimą, gdy przymrozki przyszły. Nikt przecież nie miał własnego mieszkania. Z rodzicami najczęściej się mieszkało albo u ludzi kątem. Z baru kawowego dało się przejść pod burzami z powrotem na Chmielną i ewentualnie uciec na inną radkę, jeśli zapoznamy chłopak nie przypadł do gustu w rozmowie. Ludzie poznawali się w taki sposób, bo innego nie było. Żadnego ogłosień w prasie. To przyszło później. Te ogłoszenie funkcjonowało, owszem, ale tylko na ściankach kabin toaletowych. 
Nie są mu różnie wiersze, oferty, podawano miejsce z chacki, godzinę popytu. Telefonu nikt nie miał, gdzie tam. To jakoś tak działało, samo przez się. Na przykład przeczytałeś w toalecie w Arlekinie, że na francuskiej róg meksykańskiej o 16 we wtorki czeka Diamond na ton Mirek. Jeśli byłeś zainteresowany, to szedłeś, może Mirka spotkałeś, a może kogoś zupełnie innego, kto na przykład też na spotkanie przyszedł i Mirka akurat tak się nie zastał. Zostawiliście wtedy we dwóch, szybko zapominając o Mirku i o sobie nawzajem chwilę później, najczęściej też bo to się odbywało zazwyczaj bezpośrednio, na ulicy, w bramie, w toalecie właśnie. Do takiego kibla to każdy miał prawo wyjść z ulicy. Prawdziwa demokracja. Toalety to były kluby w tamtych czasów. Cruising spot. The cruising spot, where you'd go for a tryst. There was a place on Zwater Street says Lula pensively, which I think is active to this day. We often indulged ourselves there. Girlfriends would mince up and down like they were on a catwalk or a promenade in Wajenki Park. They forgot it was an ordinary little street and they weren't headed for the palace on the water, just a local latrine. And once they'd picked up a gentleman by hook or by crook, they'd slip through a gate, hole up in a little nook somewhere or take the steps down to the john. A moment of rapture, and then instantly parting ways. In the 90s, there was a little coffee shop here, but now there's another bathroom opened up under the patronage of the literary circle of coprophiliacs. A poem of tubums, if you please. All things depend on the ass. And that's true. Down that way is a little coffee bar that's just like it used to be. It was called the Arlekin. It was particularly popular in winter once the real cold started. You see, no one had their own apartment. You usually lived with your parents or were rooming with someone else. From the coffee bar, you could pass through the courtyard back to Fjellna and conceivably slip off for another date if after your chat you'd lost interest in the boy you'd picked up. This was how people met because there was no other way. No personals ads, those came later. <laughs> well, there were ads, of course, but only on the walls of bathroom stalls. People would write all manner of things, poems, offers, places for a hookup and the hours when they'd be there. No one had phones, don't be silly. It all worked perfectly fine somehow. For instance, you might read in the bathroom of the Arlequin that St. Mirek would be waiting on the corner of Francuska and Mexikańska at four o'clock on Thursday. If you were curious, you'd stop by, maybe meet Mirek or maybe someone else entirely who might himself have come to meet Mirek and had ended up not finding him. So now it's just the two of you and Before long, you've forgotten all about Mirak, and it probably won't be long before you've forgotten about one another, too. Because it usually happened right away, on the street, in a courtyard entryway, or as I've been saying, in a bathroom. True democracy. Anyone was allowed to step off the street into one of those retreats. The bathrooms were the clubs of that era. The bathroom. There was nowhere to go, so you could go anywhere. For instance, To the palace. The most gorgeous bathrooms, the height of luxury, were in the Palace of Culture, says Lula. Of course, there was a pool there too, but it was more for young people. For seasoned players, all you had to do was step off the street, on your way back from work or out to the movies, into the bathrooms at the palace. Marble panel with a separate attendant who knew what was going on but never interfered. She just sat there quietly, minded her own business. Everything smelled glorious, the tiles and terracotta scrubbed clean, really palatial surroundings. Unfortunately, someone tried to put a stop to all that, and from then on, you could only go in for a short time after showing a ticket from one of the movie theaters, the Moda Kvartia, or the Przyjaźń, where the Kinoteca is today. So that was the end of chance encounters and cruising there. Inside, Lula lowers her voice as if we were in a church. The palace bathrooms looked quite different from how they do now. First of all, there weren't so many doors, just open passages, entrances and exits in all directions. Nowadays, there's a tendency to hem you in, to block things off, but people used to want to go up to one another to get close. There was a row of urinals against the wall, like the ones now at the National Stadium, literally an entire wall of urinals without 
any little panels or dividers, so you could see everything. You see, that right there is an important piece. It wasn't just queens cruising, it was out of towners and married men and soldiers because you got no other opportunity for self-realization. Nowadays, people complain there's nowhere to go, but look around, they've got choices beyond anyone's wildest dreams back then. I happen to think we were better off without the club because what goes on nowadays is outrageous. They're discotheques, not places where you can go cruising. Well, you can a little, but it works completely differently. It used to be you could do it anywhere. Dance clubs and gay neighborhoods would never have crossed anybody's mind. Or these ghettos like the Marais in Paris, which used to be intriguing, but nowadays you wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. You see, it's the same as ever. We're going backward and forward at the same time. The old stuff had a bit of flavor, you know, of savagery. But nowadays, where's the fun in grabbing somebody's hand, pulling him into a stall, and getting down to business? but then you shake yourself off like a goose getting out of the water and head home. That's not how we did it. For instance, you'd be walking down Marshalkovska. You had time. You'd see somebody you liked. You'd follow him or he'd follow you. You'd say hello, ask for a cigarette or the time. You wouldn't know if you'd had any luck or not. You'd start chatting and then it would all happen in a moment, bang. There was some risk in it all, some fantasy. Pure magic. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> it was fun getting to read that out loud. Um, lastly, tonight, we have Fargo Tabaki, author of the poetic series, Palestine is a Futurism. Fargo is a queer Palestinian American writer and performance artist. His writing can be found in Strange Horizons, Apex Magazine, The Shallow Ends, Mizna, Peach Mag, and elsewhere. His performance work has been programmed at Outsider Fest, Intersection Solo Fest, and elsewhere. You can find his work online at fargotabaki.com. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much. This is such a, such a wonderful event. Um, you can, I don't know if you can hear, but there's um, an incredible jazz band that is also playing right where I am. So thanks. Um, unexpected background music from my past. Um, I just want to say quickly before I. Oh, is the video okay? Close um, I just want to say quickly before I begin that um, if you like the two poems that I'm going to read tonight, or even if you don't like them, find a way wherever you are and however you can at whatever organization or institution to commit to the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement against the state of Israel. Um, thanks so much. Palestine is a futurism. Spiders are weaving a sail to get to heaven, are weaving a net to catch each other, are weaving a paper trail to follow and find a CEO and exsanguinate them, are weaving a burlap sack to hold potatoes, are weaving socks, are weaving a web to catch each other, are weaving each other, are weaving a parachute of silence, are weaving us into each other's mouths, are weaving a scarf to wrap our faces in, to hide the parameters of our faces are weaving us into a new kind of tentacle, a new kind of leg, a new kind of eye, are weaving a way to fly, a way to go thousands and thousands of miles and never be let down, are weaving a sail to love and also to kill. Palestine is a futurism, prophecies, cruising Jerusalem. How we make meaning of ourselves and our being as Palestinian when we are no longer beholden to understanding ourselves in the shadows of disaster is not just a passing whim, a theoretical exercise. To ask how and who we are now and who we will be when we are free insists that our future selves are always in sight, that our freedom is always in sight. Sophia Azeb. Miracle makers, we touch heaven with our toes. Heaven looks like us. We build our own futures. We build them to look like us. No soft power over us. Radically, we define what it means to be us. 
Our slingshots are a collectivism. Our fishnets are a Nostradamus. Return is a future, is a past. The past is a future we return to. Sunspot tasters, we rise on. Science resistors, we hex the world. Only the end of the world for us. Only the biggest us we can build. In the land of no states, I will lick your eyeballs. In the sleep of no documents, I will kiss your iris. The soil retains its ideologies. The soil turns them into batatas. City wall, lean against, I stroke your stubble. Tunnel walkers, we dissolve any military. An undeclared end to all declarations. The sun has set on the British Empire on the American empire, on the empire of Goldman Sachs, on the empire of military contractors, on the empire of eviction enforcers, on the empire of hunger consultants, on the empire of securitization, on the empire of possibility eaters. Inside a poem, we found a tunnel. Inside the tunnel, we found ourselves. We liked our taste. We tasted our collectivism. We remembered the land was already a Marxism. We remembered our names and the art of making new ones. Lay down your arms and I will lay with them. Make me the strings of a gutted piano. I will writhe and make the song of our only nation return is an ontological dance step. The birds are teaching us to stay. Future is a dirty batata. Every day we are saying no to the things that keep us apart. Every day we are saying no to enclosure. Every day we are cruising Jerusalem. Every day Jerusalem is cruising us back. Palestine is a futurism. Futurism is an expansiveness of understanding. Futurism is a demolition of monuments. Futurism, a rioting cactus. Palestine, a relation of loveliness. Futurism is a Palestine. Palestine is a system of care. Care is a futurism of hands. Futurism is a Palestine. Palestine is already here. Palestine is already everywhere. Thank you, Varga. That was really amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, uh, if you'd like to donate to Foglifter, a Bay Area platform uplifting powerful intersectional and transgressive queer and trans writing, please visit the link in the chat. Uh, and you can sign up for the Words Without Borders newsletter to stay up to date with our latest issues. Uh, so now we are on to the Q&A section of uh, the evening. If you have any questions, please go ahead and post them in the chat. But uh, I see that we have some already that have rolled in. So uh, I'll, uh, let's get right to it. Uh, this is a question here for Kanika. Kanika, you mentioned your piece is in progress. I'm wondering if you can talk more about your ideas for where that amazing piece might go from here. I can't wait to read more of it. Thank you. Um, I'm really letting the constraints, in, in a sense, guide my thinking. Um, that's why I'm using constraints, the various constraints on the language and the structure. Uh, because I think, at least for me, um, there's really a danger or temptation with um, in, in exploring assimilation of thinking about it in facile, self-serving ways and um, limiting the language that I have access to is both a way of representing the restrictions associated with assimilative circumstances or um, forces, and also putting me in the position of having to think, or having to extend my thinking beyond where I might stop if I could use any language I wanted. Um, so I'm not really 
uh, I don't know how much I can say about um, where the project is headed um, apart from the fact that uh, I'm using these constraints to guide me, such as um, you, such as titling each piece in the collection um, using um, an anagram of assimilation, for example. Thank you. It's so interesting to hear. Um, we have a question here for Alex. Uh, Alex, I'm wondering how you came into contact with Javier's work. What about the text drew you in? And how would you think about channeling that something into the English language version? Hi, everyone. Um, I reading reading the newspaper online, I think I was I was I was really interested in finding some um, stories um, about queer life coming out of Central America. It was not um, a region that I was familiar with. Everyone always reads, you know, like, especially um, earlier and now dead um, queer writers, uh, male writers like Manuel Puig, um, Reina Larenas. And so I was really looking for something a lot more recent, something that was from a zone that isn't as popularly or as widely read in, in the United States and even within I'd say Latin American readership or Spanish language readership. And so it was a, it was a, a text that really struck me. I'm reading the, reading the entire book, Hombres en los Lados. And if you speak Spanish, I mean, I think that um, I would recommend all of you to, to read it, to pick up a copy um, because it really is a thrilling text. It tells the story of Jota Jota. And immediately right off the bat in the, in the first chapter, I was really captivated um, by the way in which, you know, this child uh, was immediately marked by those around him as being as being as being gay, and the ways in which even even his family reacted. And you know, there's a scene early on in the book where um, where they they they're they're walking on this pilgrimage, and you know, they they want to to in a sense find in a sense a cure also for this for this for this child. And and it was a very moving story. I thought. And translating it, translating it was, I mean, I mean, I think it was it was a pleasure as much as it was also a challenge uh, to confront a story where, um, you know, um, there's a child who immediately isn't being entirely accepted by those around him, but that throughout his 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 life there there are moments that do mark him. There are moments where he does gain acceptance, and and even like Javier could speak to this too. But the finals, the the final chapter of the novel. Um, I, I, I think that the, the translation was, was challenging and uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Alex. And yeah, just a reminder to folks in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to put them into the chat. Um, there's a question here for me. Uh, how does it feel to revisit this translation after some time has passed? And can you tell us more about this author and his work? Uh, sure. Well, so the the author is Remigius Rijinski. He's a uh, uh, he's a, he's an academic in Poland. He studies queer history um, and he studies uh, he's a specialist in sort of French philosophy. Um, and this is his first. Uh, this book was his first non-academic publication. Um, it was sort of a surprise hit in Poland. Um, and since then, Remy has uh, has published a couple of books about the historical experiences of uh, of gay men in Poland uh, during the Second World War, for instance, or under communism. Um, for me, um, I mean, I read this book and I just like I just thought it was amazing. I thought I, I I know very little about Foucault. I have to admit, but I thought it was just such a wild portrait of of Warsaw at a very particular time in its history and the language. Is so rich, you know, because he's finding he's finding um, these people who are still around who remember um, what who remember the gay scene effectively in the late fifties and early sixties when Foucault was there, and um, uh, and they speak in this slang that doesn't exist anymore, really. And it was a huge challenge to get that over into English. And I think the biggest change between when an excerpt of the book was first published in Words Without Borders and the version that's, you know, that's going into print now was that I did 
so much more research on um, what that slang should sound like in English um, and kind of unpicking the different dynamics in American queer slang um, from, from the 50s and 60s um, and coming up with a slang that still worked in English and still sounded right, but that didn't operate in the same kind of cultural framework was really, really tricky. Um, and then I would sort of get two thirds of the way through it and realize that I had kind of misunderstood the Polish in the first place and I would have to start all over again because there were these words that I just didn't know. There were these expressions that I just didn't know. Um, so it was an enormous amount of fun. I felt like I was really stretching the limits of my Polish working on this book and my English to an extent. And as you can hear, it's a very like oral book. Um, so it was very fun to, to practice doing all of this stuff out loud as I was working on it too. Um, uh, we have a question here for Javier. Uh, I was struck by the theme of exile in your piece. Could you talk about why you chose to place Gustavo in exile? and how that fits into the larger context of exile in or from Panama. Great, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I was, um, when I started writing the, the novel, I was actually thinking uh, about writing the history of the 1980s in Panama, which was uh, a period of the end of a dictatorship that we had back then. And uh, that ends with um, the invasion of the U.S. The, uh, Panama is invaded by the USA in, in 1989, and, and most of my plays actually cover that that, that period. Um, so I was as I was trying to find some some sort of kind of angle or some some interesting story. Uh, I, I kind of met and interviewed a lot of people that had kind of gone in exile actually because of political and uh, economic reasons, uh, especially to Canada, the U.S., and to the U.K. Um, but I was still kind of not finding the, the, the soul of, of the story. And um, back then in 2012, 13, I was hearing still stories of young people, men and women who were still struggling with coming out with, as Alex was saying, kind of the, the context, not understanding them. And I was thinking, well, this story is still relevant. It was relevant in the 1980s. It's relevant in the 2000s, uh, this issue of kind of acceptance and uh, being who you are and the struggles uh, of just c coming out. So I tried to, to bring the two things together, the idea of someone uh, leaving the country or getting into exile, not because of political reasons, but for kind of the sexual orientation. And that's what uh, kind of is a common theme. It's not only with his stepfather, but also uh, Jota Jota, the main character at the end, also has to make a decision as to whether he stays in Panama or he leaves it and he goes into exile to be the person that he really is. And at the end, that's the decision that he makes, that he needs to leave the country uh, in order to be who he, who he truly is. Thank you, Javier. Um, we have a question here for Fargo. Fargo, your performance of this poem was so powerful. Can you talk about how you see your poetry and performance art entwined or informing each other? Do you see them as two separate forms of expression? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, they're absolutely intertwined for me. And I think both of them, because um, I think of both of them essentially as projects to bend language until it breaks. Uh, because I think that it's through those moments of rupture and those moments of break that we glimpse uh, and can experience better worlds. We can stick our hands in and wiggle our fingers around and see what they feel like. And so I think for me, um, Generally, what happens is that uh, if I am able to achieve that the kind of rupture and the kind of breaking uh, that I want to on the page, then it stays on the page. But uh, if not, then I turn to performance, which offers another set of tools, um, another set of tools to embody that language and that text and to break it open. Um, you have breath and voice and movement and the relationship between your body and other people's bodies. Um, so uh, a lot of times something that I think is going to be a performance will actually turn out to just be something that lives on the page, which requires a, a different set of tools and techniques. Uh, and sometimes it's the other way around. I write something thinking it's it's just going to be a, a piece of text. And then I, I feel the need to um, to let it breathe more and let it move more, which I, I think more and more is happening with uh, these set of poems that I've been working on uh, all 
titled one version of Palestine is a futurism. I think they're moving more and more towards performance and I've explored them through uh, puppetry, which is something that I've been working a lot with and, and also through song. Uh, and, and I find that uh, I think they're secretly, they're, t they're telling me that they're more performances than they are texts. Um, but that's kind of usually the process for me is that uh, what begins as one thing might tell me that it's a different thing uh, and that it requires those extra or different tools in order to um, accomplish what it wants to accomplish. Thanks, Fargo. That's, 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 that's such a fascinating answer. Um, uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, I know that we're we're past nine o'clock here, but this is so this is this is last call for questions. Um, going once, going twice. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been really wonderful. Uh, if you'd like to donate to Foglifter, a Bay Area platform uplifting powerful intersectional and transgressive queer and trans writing, and why wouldn't you? It's a really fantastic initiative. Uh, please visit the link that we've been sharing uh, throughout the evening in the chat. Um, you can donate at any time. You don't have to do it during, uh, during the event. Um, and don't forget to sign up for the Words Without Borders newsletter to stay up to date on their latest issues. That's at wordswithoutborders.org slash subscribe. Um, so thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you to all of our readers. Um, this has been a really fantastic evening for me and I hope you've all enjoyed it at least as much as I have. So take care everyone, and have a great night.